Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brianna Venozzi. Federal health agencies are planning to announce a new warning this week, according to reports by the Washington Post, into the possibility that Johnson & Johnson's coronavirus vaccine may be linked to a serious but rare side effect called Guillain-Barre syndrome, a neurological disorder in which the immune system attacks the nerves. The CDC is stressing that the benefits of the vaccine still outweigh the potential side effect especially with new highly contagious variants spreading. In New Jersey, the Delta strain is now the predominant variant, representing about 41% of cases, according to the Department of Health. Statewide, more than 5.1 million residents are now fully vaccinated, with 227 new cases and four more deaths being reported. If you've lost or damaged your vaccination card, you're in luck. Starting today, the state will provide digital access to your COVID-19 vaccination record through a free app called Docket. Now, it's not a vaccine passport, according to Governor Murphy, but it is an option for residents who need to share their status for one reason or another. I'm where I've been on, on passports. Um, I'm, I'm not hell no, but we continue to, to need to make more progress on the equity front. And progress is being made, there's no question. We've, we've, we've come a long way, but in particular in black and brown communities, we're not yet where we need to be. And I continue to believe until we are, and, we've not give, and, and until we've given it everything we've got and that everyone has had a fair access to the vaccine, then while I'm open-minded, I, I don't think the timing is right. The national outbreak of gun violence doesn't appear to be letting up here at home or elsewhere. President Biden today met with city police leaders from around the country to talk about how to reduce crime. Among them, Lieutenant Anthony Lima from Newark's police department. According to state police records for June, both Newark and Essex County lead the state in gun violence. Biden's plan focuses on giving funding to cities in need of more officers and cracking down on the flow of illegal guns. But a lot of the strategies being being discussed today were voluntary, encouraging cities to use COVID-19 relief money to help law enforcement by increasing community support, jobs for teenagers, and other alternatives to traditional policing. This week, tens of thousands of households across the state will open their mailbox and find a check. Some families will receive two, a federal child tax credit slated to cut child poverty in half in New Jersey and the U.S and a state rebate that was promised last year as part of a deal to raise taxes on millionaires. It comes just as advocates say low- and moderate-income families need it most. Melissa Rose Cooper reports. I live with my husband and I have four kids. Uh, the pandemic has impacted our work. I personally lost hours of work. Carolina lives in West New York with her husband and four children. Since the pandemic, both she and her husband have been in and out of jobs, putting an increasing strain on their finances. When I lost my job, I was left home taking care of my family and our well-being. My husband also unfortunately lost work for a couple of weeks. However, during the peak of the pandemic, he was asked to work and continues working despite the risk of getting COVID. Now financial help is on the way for Carolina's family and hundreds of thousands of other New Jerseyans who will be receiving a little extra cash every month thanks to the American Rescue Plan. Eligible families in New Jersey who filed their 2019 or 2020 taxes will begin receiving payments of up to $300 a month um, through every month through the end of December. Um, and really, you know, especially for families that don't have status and on account of their status haven't been able to receive any federal or state relief to date, 
um, you know, this is huge. In addition to the payments made through December, the law provides up to another $1,800 per child to be paid out next year. Married households making up to $150,000 a year, anyone filing head of households with a yearly income of $112,500, and single filers making up to $75,000 a year are eligible. There are many Congress people who fought for this for years to bring the numbers up so that people can live as human beings. Here in New Jersey, many households are also getting a $500 tax rebate in an effort to help low- and middle-income families climb out of debt. According to community advocates, the extra funds will help nearly 1.6 million children across the state, many who are children of color. Having, you know, $300 or $250 extra a month means that folks can have money to lean on to help them rebuild post-pandemic, right? We know that you know, even with, uh, you know, federal assistance programs, there continue to be tens of thousands of families that stand on bread lines every day. This means that folks are able to, you know, put more into keeping their families afloat, right? Covering the rent bills or the, loose, uh, the, the light bills or just starting to pay back all the rent that's due. But even though Carolina says she's grateful, she says it's not enough. These monthly payments would be a start, which would allow for us to cover groceries for my family. However, this is not enough to cover rent or medical bills or any utility bills for our family. Working class families have been able to provide to our economy, and we ask that the six months be elongated so our children and our families are able to thrive. Families are expected to start receiving child tax credit payments on July 15th. Community activists say they'll be campaigning to make the credit permanent. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. It's a wake-up call for some local leaders whose cities house scores of high-rise buildings. In the wake of the partial condo collapse in Surfside, Florida, Jersey City's mayor is tightening safety rules on buildings, all in an effort to avoid a disaster like the one still playing out. Leia Michigan reports. It's catastrophic and sad, and uh, we recognize the need that we need to be doing more on the local level. The cause of the collapse of Champlain Tower South in Surfside, Florida, is still under investigation, but the horrific situation is reverberating all the way up in New Jersey, where communities like Jersey City are reevaluating its building regulations as everyone awaits answers. In the wake of what happened in southern Florida, we had multiple residents in different high rise buildings reach out to us and say, look, um, I believe that our building has an issue. There has been engineering reports that have been issued to the condo board in our building. Um, but they haven't acted on it. Mayor Steve Fulop says the new legislation, which will be presented to City Council on Wednesday, will require a structural engineer to inspect the facade of buildings in Jersey City every five years and structural inspections every 10 years. New Jersey doesn't have these types of laws today, so that's the big concern. There's a lot of permits and approvals that need to happen initially before they get a certificate of occupancy. But once that certificate of occupancy is issued, uh, the buildings are really governed by themselves. A structural engineer is really only involved uh, during an initial design phase or if it's going through some major alteration or rehabilitation. According to the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, multifamily buildings are inspected every five years for maintenance, but not by an engineer. They look for habitability provisions for heat, infestation, and lead hazards in specific conditions. Inspectors also perform a visual, non-destructive inspection of accessible foundation structural members, adding if they notice something that looks questionable for structural purposes, they would alert the building owner and the local construction official. If a determination can't be made, DCA says the town might need to contact an engineer for review. The issue right now is often we don't have visibility into those sorts of issues because New Jersey doesn't have any sort of requirements where they have to submit that paperwork to the city. So the city wouldn't know if a condo board is aware of an issue that they're not correcting. Mayor Phillip says his new legislation would create transparency. I'll give you an example. We have a large uh, development complex that has some issues in their garage underneath where there's some cracks and water leakage. Very, very similar narrative to what you've seen in Southern Florida or what we heard about. And um, they had an assessment that would be close to $50 million to repair it 
uh, in its entirety. So you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars in added fees to each condo owner. Um, and the board is reluctant to do that. Once the city's aware that there's an issue that could put people at risk, then the city can lean into it a little more aggressively to make sure that it's getting corrected. The level that the deterioration contributed to the, the ultimate collapse is, is you know, highly unknown at this point. When you're talking about a structure that's been sitting there for a long time, it's likely that it's a confluence of issues. Assistant Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at NJIT, Matthew Bandelt, says the risk of a building all of a sudden collapsing is extremely low. A lot of times we'll, you know, we'll, we'll find an, an error um, that, that maybe presents itself during construction. The first time there's, there's a large natural hazard that occurs to it. Um, but it's, it's rare to have something just sitting there for, for 40 years and, and collapse. Still, Governor Murphy insinuated changes are on the way to ensure uh, safety. We are re revisiting code, uh, regularity of inspection, etc., uh, as we should. This is a, an, a horrible, horrible wake-up call. Governor Murphy reached out when we announced it and said that he thought it was a good idea. And uh, I would suspect in the next legislative session that somebody introduces something very similar on the statewide level. NJ Spotlight News, I'm Leia Mishkin. Well, last year it was toilet paper and packaged meat. Now some 17 months into the pandemic, there's a global microchip shortage, and it's pushing consumer prices higher on everything from laptops and printers to cars. Dealerships across the state are being plagued by low inventory. You think the housing market was tough. The shortage means even used cars are going for sky-high rates. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has the story. I think it's a little crazy. I think I've never seen anything like it before. Debbie Kozell drove 26 miles to Hawthorne Chevrolet to buy a used car for her daughter. Empty parking spots gape on the showroom floor here. It's normally packed with shiny new vehicles. The dealership usually stocks about 500 new cars, but today it's got about 80 on the lot, most of them already sold. New car sales stalled by a microchip shortage. It took us probably like three or four months to just find something in our price range. There's no cars. And anytime you go on someplace, it's like it's gone. I had to snap this up before it was gone. There was like people looking at it as we were buying it. 38 years and I've never seen anything like this to this magnitude of, of lack of new car inventory. And it's only because of the chips. Did you see this coming? Never saw it coming. Hawthorne Chevy's president, Steve Barna, says the manufacturer can't supply new vehicles without semiconductor microchips. Cars currently rolling off assembly lines, many built without chips, often end up parked and waiting for those tiny critical parts before they can ship. The shortage started during the COVID lockdown when people worked and went to school from home and ordered TVs and smartphones and laptops. Everybody had to have a laptop to compute, uh, to uh, be able to attend this. So the demand for those chips skyrocketed. At the same time, because of COVID, some of the factories had to be shut down. Want to buy a truck? That shortage is even worse, although many customers are flush with cash saved during the pandemic and eager to buy, says manager Chuck Serra. And they walk in the door and they don't understand. You know, I need a van. I need it now. I don't. When can I see it? Maybe August, maybe September, and people just walk out. It's just really, really bad. We turn away people every day, and it's really frustrating. We have people calling from North Carolina, from Wisconsin, from Michigan, and buying used cars, and even new cars if they could find the one that they are looking for in our particular lot here. While inventory is down, prices are up. Carfax reports that the overall list price for new vehicles rose 25% from a year ago. People are paying over list price. Somebody I saw bought a, a car with list price of 37000 and on the sticker on the window, it had manufacturer's suggested retail price. Then he had a line in there called additional dealer markup, $3,000. And they said to him, if you don't pay it, somebody else will. And the prices of cars are ridiculous. Cars and trucks, you can't buy them. And if you do buy them, what you used to pay $5,000 for, now you're paying $7,500 and you gotta fight for him. Used car dealer Eric Jensinger says he gets into bidding wars over pre-owned vehicles. Regardless, his inventory's plummeted, his lot's close to empty. How many cars can you usually fit in here? Oh, back here about 40. 40? At least. And you got how many now? 
Uh, maybe there's 10. He says spare parts can also be tough to find. As for chips manufactured mostly in Asia, President Biden's proposed some $50 billion to beef up the U.S. semiconductor industry. Dealers who'd hope to reap a revenue bonanza feel stuck in neutral between the low supply and high demand. So do customers. It's hard. It's hard for people who can't afford a new car and now um, they're stuck there's no there's no used cars out there and the supply chain could stay crimped for at least a couple more months analysts predict i'm brenda flanagan nj spotlight news lawmakers may be running out of options to challenge new york's commuter tax on jersey workers rhonda schaffler has details and tonight's top business stories rhonda Brianna, the Murphy administration says it will continue to fight for those residents who've been paying New York income taxes, even though they've been working at home in New Jersey throughout the pandemic. But it is unclear what options the administration can pursue. New Jersey backed a legal challenge on commuter taxes that was filed by New Hampshire against Massachusetts. But last month, the Supreme Court declined to hear the case. Some lawmakers are also pushing for the administration to take action, but next steps remain unclear. As NJ Spotlight's John Reitmeyer reports, not only would the state treasury benefit from added tax dollars, New Jersey taxpayers would also benefit if they no longer had to pay taxes to New York. There are differences in the way that New York and New Jersey levy income taxes, and the rates may be higher for someone who's paying taxes to New York than they would pay if they were paying their taxes to New Jersey. And so individual taxpayers could benefit if they have to pay their taxes uh, to New Jersey instead of New York. For more on John's report, go to njspotlightnews.org. New Jersey residents have a chance to offer their opinions on a program designed to help get the state's economy back on track. This week, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority is holding public sessions looking for input on a draft rule proposal for its new Main Street Recovery Finance Program. That's a $100 million fund for small businesses. The fund will provide grants directly to businesses as well as loans and technical assistance. New Brunswick-based Johnson & Johnson is launching new global research centers to try to accelerate research on major health issues. The company says COVID-19 showed that investments in early stage research are critical. Lakeland Bank is acquiring First Constitution Bank in a bid to expand its presence in central Jersey. The deal creates the fifth largest bank to be headquartered in New Jersey, and it's expected to close later this year. Now here's a check on Wall Street trading for today. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. This November, voters won't just have the governor's race at the top of the ballot. They'll have to decide whether legal sports betting should extend to the college level. It's already legal in 25 other states, but the idea may not be as popular in Jersey as advocates hoped. According to a recent Fairleigh Dickinson University poll, voters oppose the idea by a two to one margin. Just 25 percent of those surveyed support expanding gambling to local college teams. 49% were against it and 23% were unsure. But some lawmakers and business groups see legalizing the gambling as a way to boost sports wagering revenue for the state. New Jersey lawmakers really were um, very strong in their support for this. There was almost no objection uh, as they were voting. You know, some of the reasons are that the state does get money from this uh, tax revenue, be it whether you're, vote, um, excuse me, you're betting in person at a casino or at a racetrack or doing it online. Um, so there's certainly a benefit to the state from that. Uh, so what happens next is there really needs to be some sort of, you know, public push for this. As we get closer to Election Day, unfinished business remains with how campaigns handle sexual assault and harassment allegations by workers and volunteers. The state went through a political reckoning with the Me Too movement and took critical steps toward addressing the issue over the last year. But one big component is still on the table, an independent office dedicated to investigating those complaints that won't be up and running until long after the November election is over. Joanna Gagas reports. Really part of it is my responsibility. Just took us 
a while to get to this point. Senator Loretta Weinberg says she allowed too much input on two bills that create protections for political campaign workers who experience sexual harassment or assault. The Senate recently passed the bills, but they won't get a hearing in the Assembly until after the summer, and even if the governor signs them right away, the protections won't be in place for this year's gubernatorial campaign. Though it's not passed in time for this election, I think certainly every candidate for office is keenly aware of it. So I think people will be, hopefully will be particularly careful in the way the environment around their campaigns run. One protection would be an oversight committee under ELEC, the Election Law Enforcement Commission, to investigate claims of harassment that may arise during this election season. But it is a topic at the forefront of both the Murphy and Chitterelli campaigns. Murphy's campaign under First Lady Tammy Murphy has hired the HR consulting firm CultureUpt that will provide mandatory sexual harassment and employment implicit bias training and will develop a code of conduct. It will also create a reporting structure and provide independent investigation services of a claim that's made along with best practices for termination. They do training programs regularly as we ramp the team up and we are ramping it up pretty substantially. Um, and it's a firm that is quite renowned in this space and I'm very, very happy and glad that you made that decision. Giving the credit to his wife. Assemblyman Jack Cittarelli has also set up a training and oversight process on his campaign. Anybody that works in our campaign is aware of what will not be tolerated. All of our employees go through the training. All of our employees sign a document saying that they're aware of the policy. And all of our volunteers are made aware that anything less than the most appropriate behavior will not be tolerated. He set up a reporting hotline that goes to retired Senator Diane Allen that would then be investigated by the law firm Squire Patton Boggs. Neither campaign had these structures in place during their 2017 runs for governor. Cittarelli blames Murphy. I refer to this as Murphy's Law. It, it, it probably wouldn't be in existence if it was not for the conduct that took place during his campaign for governor four years ago. The issue did come to a head when Katie Brennan alleged she was raped by a Murphy campaign staffer, Al Alvarez, when they both worked on his 2017 campaign. Alvarez denies the allegation. But Weinberg says sexual harassment and misogyny in politics dates way back. I came from an era where we didn't even have vocabulary to use to talk about these things. You know, it was just it was the normal part of the atmosphere and you learned how to evade it as best you could, uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. What happens if there is another Katie Brennan-like situation during one of these campaigns? Well, now we have better laws in place, some of which came directly out of Katie Brennan's experience. Like a 2019 law that bans enforcement of non-disclosure agreements, or NDAs, in sexual harassment claims. That law didn't originally override the NDAs from Murphy's 2017 campaign, although he later freed staff to talk. Cittarelli announced at the start of this campaign that he would require no NDAs. But until the bills become law, it's still up to the campaigns to govern themselves. Lobbyist Sabine Massey says it's better to get it right than fast. Something like this takes a lot of time to set up. It's the first ever model in the nation. And frankly, if we were rushing it to meet the deadline before the elections, there are some things that could have been missed. I mean, this election season will be different just inherently because of the conversation and transparency around this. So for me, this is a step in the right direction. And a step that, for many women in politics, can't come soon enough. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. Meanwhile, in Newark, an interactive museum will honor residents' movements for social justice. The city's first police precinct will be transitioned into the Newark Community Museum at the end of the year and act as a headquarters for the Office of Violence Prevention and Trauma Recovery. It's intended to chronicle the local activism that's helped bring about positive police reforms. The precinct is also the location where the 1967 Newark Rebellion began 54 years ago today. New York City historian Junius Williams will lead the effort converting the building into a permanent display, portraying the struggle for justice and an intolerance for anything less. What about those other stories that make Newark who we are? The other stories of struggle for freedom, for dignity, the successes, the fails, failures, the ups, the downs, the people who led those struggles and then 
made a difference in one way or another, men and women, black, Latino, white. What about the special culture that gives Newark its flavor? That's F-L-A-V-A, flavor. What about that culture? The music, the dance, the visual arts, the drama, all those things that make up the survive and thrive, the good and the bad. And that does it for us tonight, but head over to njspotlightnews.org or any of our social channels to continue following our reporting. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire news team, thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing, business leaders, the caretakers of our historic landmarks, and the custodians of our public safety. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was gonna be here, nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.